Praise the Lord. Good morning, Hebron. The Lord's presence has been manifesting in our midst, and uh, he has been speaking to us. For the English messages, we've switched over to the topic of the epistle of James. Be doers of the word. Be doers of the word. Talk the talk and walk the talk also. Don't just talk the talk and not walk the walk. Be doers of the word. So today we will look, it was started last week by Joe. Today we will look at 1 1 and 1 8. 1 1 and 1 8. So if you would turn to James 1 1 and 1 8. I'll start with this quote The freest person, man or woman, in the world is someone whose life is as a slave to Christ. You know, we don't like to use that term loosely as a slave. And uh, it's been written out of the Bible um, because of the connotations associated with the word slave. Um, today, I would like to speak to you on a message entitled, Is Jesus Just Your Savior, or Is He Also Your Lord and Master? Is Jesus Just Your Savior Only, or Is He Your Lord and Master? The subtitle is, Living as a Doulos of Christ. Living as a doulos of Christ. First, I'd like to look a little bit further into this author, James. We first encounter James as the younger brother of Jesus. We know that Jesus was uh, born of the Lord, uh, the Father, um, and was a virgin birth through Mary. And afterwards, Mary... And Joseph had many children, and the Bible tells us so in Matthew 13, 55, and Mark 6, 3. It talks about four boys and at least two girls that Mary and Joseph had. So Jesus uh, was the oldest of those younger uh, siblings and was the uh, oldest brother of the Lord Jesus. You could say half-brother, but it, he was the brother of Jesus. And so, imagine with me what that would have been like. We know that Jesus was sinless. He was a perfect child. The only glimpse that we get into his childhood is in uh, the age of 12 when he and uh, his family went to, uh, went to Jerusalem. And we see that he uh, did not come with a caravan of people going back. And he is uh, found in the temple. And we see that the Lord is uh, the, the parents are asking them, asking him, uh, why have you done this to us, right? So uh, even that, he was, te he was uh, learning and asking questions of the people in the temple. So that's about the worst thing that he did, right? Uh, Learn the word of God. So he was uh, perfect, as we know. Jesus, being fully God and fully man, he lived a perfect life. And uh, that was the role model that James, the younger brother, had to grow up with. Uh, those are hard shoes to fill, I would say. Having uh, two kids myself, you know, there's always that comparison game, right? And then there is uh, James the skeptic. If you go to John chapter 7, verse 5, you'll see that James was one of those people that did not necessarily believe in the divinity of Christ as, he, as they were growing up together. It might have been like 27 years or so uh, before, uh, that they grew up together before Jesus entered into public ministry. And for 27 years, they were growing up in the same home. We know that children at that time used to uh, follow after their parents' uh, trade. So they were probably both in the carpentry trade in the Nazarite uh, division of this town. And so... Uh, even though he grew up with him, since Jesus did not do any miracles or did not start his public ministry until age 30, and he might have been 25 to 30, uh, the younger brother, um, he was still a skeptic. In fact, in fact, so much so that we see that uh, Joseph has since died, and Mary and uh, um, uh, the other disciples are there at the foot of the cross, and we see that Jesus is entrusting his mother with John the, Bap John the uh, disciple, rather than uh, entrusting his mother with the brother, James, or the other brothers, because we think that they were skeptics. They did not believe in the divinity of Christ. 
There's a pearl to be learned there. There could be many years that you're coming to the church. You're coming here because your parents bring you at a young age. You might be living with Jesus, but you might not have Jesus inside of you. You might not truly know Jesus until you have an experience uh, that James had. We see that uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, we see that 3 through 8, when Jesus uh, was the risen Christ, he came and met with certain people. Most of the people that he met with were his disciples and 5,000 people. Um, and then we see the only uh, non-believer he could have met with was James, the brother. And that completely, completely changed his life. You know, he grew up with his brother for many uh, decades, and now uh, he saw his mother suffering as he was uh, put to death on the cross, and he saw that he was put in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, and now he is reappearing to him in flesh, and he is now talking to him. And after seeing the risen Christ, his life completely changed. And that is what we need in our lives as well. We need to see the risen Christ, and we will not be the same again. We will not remain a skeptic. We will not just know about Jesus. We will start to follow him wholeheartedly after we see the risen Christ. And that is what we see in the life of James. James uh, became, because he was uh, raised in this Nazarite sect, uh, we see that he is called James the Just or James the Righteous because of his character traits. He was honest. He was pious. He was disciplined. And he grew up as James the Just or the Righteous. We see uh, later in Acts, uh, chap many chapters of Acts, including Acts 15, that he became a pastor. And in Galatians, we see that he became the pillar of the church. Along uh, with John and Peter, uh, they were the pillars of the church to the Jewish converts, the Messianic Jews. And we see that he became just, righteous, a pillar, and, and a pastor. Joe last week mentioned uh, his untimely end. It was after being in the ministry as the first pastor of the church in Jerusalem, the original church, uh, as, as basically the first pastor ever, uh, that uh, he had to go through uh, many trials. Uh, and uh, we see that he was uh, thrown off of the temple. And uh, then because he was not dead, they stoned him. And uh, someone came with a club and beat him to death. That was the end of this man. Um, when they went to get his body, they noticed something unique, that he had uh, what's described as old camel knees historically. James, the one with the old camel knees, because he, he was always in prayer. And that's one of the topics we'll study in James chapter 5, that he was a man of prayer and he encourages us to pray. So he, his foot was so calloused, uh, sorry, his knees were so calloused, that he had camel knees is what is described about James. So we know well that James has all the right to boast. He could, as he's writing this, um, say that he is the brother of Jesus. He's the oldest brother of Jesus. He could have said he was the first pastor of the church and all of these many things to boast about. But let's go to James 1.1 and how does he introduce himself? Depends on the version you have. I know in Malayalam it says Dasan. Uh, but uh, if you look at the ESV, it says servant. In the New King James Version, it says a bond servant. And uh, if you go back to the original Greek, the word that is used is James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. A slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, as they were writing the King James Version, there was all this negative connotations to slavery, obviously, because it was a heinous act. And they... Uh, purposely decided to take that word out and they put in bond servant. Uh, so the word, the difference might be adima versus dasan, right? It's very close, but not, maybe not, it doesn't hit home as much to know that uh, not just James, if you look at the other uh, writers, if you, and we'll get to some of that, Paul in Romans 1.1 1, 1 says that he was a slave of God. And John, uh, John in Revelation says that he is a slave of God. And we know that there's many other people that refer to themselves as this word, doulos, doulos. So we're going to learn a couple of Greek words today. Doulos is a slave, a bondman, or a man uh, who is in servile conditions. Somebody that serves is doulos. 
And the primary original meaning is a slave. And that's the word that's used, doulos. It's one who gives himself up to another person's will and whose service uh, he is under. And specifically, he is saying that he's used... Uh, he's being used under the service of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to extend uh, and uh, expand the kingdom of God. Someone who's devoted to another regardless or disregarding their own interests. And then there's also the meaning of a servant or an attendant. So uh, we are now familiar with the word doulos, and that's the word that is used in Greek. This particular word is used by many authors, and as I mentioned, Romans 1.1, Paul says, Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle and singled out for God's good news. Simon Peter says the same thing in 2 Peter 1.1. It says, a slave and an apostle of Christ Jesus, I am writing to you who share the same precious faith we have. This faith given to you because of the justice and the fairness of the Lord Jesus Christ, our God and Savior. The, half, the other half-brother of Jesus, Jude, the one chapter he writes, uh, it, it says what? A slave of the Lord Jesus and a brother of James. So uh, we also see that uh, there are many usages of the word co-slave. Epaphras, the one who is with you, a slave of the Lord Jesus, greets you. So we see that this word is used over 150 times or so in the New Testament, duolos. And the original meaning goes back to this word slave. I know that that's not something that we necessarily uh, would like to think about ourselves as slaves. You know, there's so much negative connotation in the 21st century. But if you go back and study the Greco-Roman times and the Hebrew times, that it was common to have slavery then. And it was... Uh, not it, the same type of uh, relationship that we think about today, uh, but it was a more loving relationship. In fact, the centurion sent uh, someone uh, to inquire or to heal his slave, we see. So th this is based out of uh, uh, mutual love and respect. And not only does the Lord say that we are his slaves, but he also said that we are his friends. As pastor taught last week, we are his heirs. We have citizenship in heaven. So um, this particular word that I'm using today is the word slave that is in verse 1, verse 1 of James. If there's a slave, then there must be a master. There must be a master, right? And uh, uh, when we think about the word master, there's a couple of different words that are used. And I think Pastor John Verghese mentioned it uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, the first one is the word curios, curios. It's a person uh, that... Uh, is considered master and lord, a possessor uh, of things, the owner. Um, and then there, it is also a title given to uh, servants to get, greet their master. Uh, and it's also given to God, the Messiah, uh, Kyrios. So if, there is, if we are doulos, the master is Kyrios. And then there's one other word that is used, and uh, he mentioned it uh, a few weeks ago. Despotis, and it stood out to me because the English word is despot, right? You think of an evil ruler uh, when you think of despot. Uh, you think of someone who rules by power and authority. But the word of God says in Greek that, uh, that the Lord uh, God, as well as the Lord Jesus, uh, are both used in those terms despot. And it shows the ownership or the supremacy or the authority of a sovereign master and Lord. So we are duelos, if you agree with me on that, we are servants, we are slaves, then we, who is our master? It is uh, Curios, the Lord, and the sovereign Lord master, Despotus. And I, I have the verses there that the, the words Despotus is used in. Um, so uh, I wanna point out again here that Christ was also called Despotus twice. And one of the times is in Jude, uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 4, uh, where it says what? Our only master, Despotus, and Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus is equivalent to God. He is given the ultimate authority. He is the supreme one. He is also our Lord and our master. Uh, and so uh, James 1, 1, going back to it, 
It says, James, a slave of God and of the Lord, and also a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So putting these words together, a doulos to my curios and despotis, right? To my Lord, my master, uh, my sovereign Lord, you are not your own. You are God's property. You know, that's, that's uh, hard to say in today's society when we're all about, you know, liberation and freedom and it's my body and I, I'll do what I want with it. But we are not our own. Let me repeat that. We are God's property. So we cannot do anything and everything that we want like the world does with their body. We need to give our bodies over as a living sacrifice to the Lord. And that is what he expects of us as a duelos of the Lord. So uh, let's look at that uh, quickly here as time is going by. Jesus ransomed us, redeemed us, and purchased us, we see, not by perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as we've been singing. We've been bought with a price, and that is the blood of Christ. So we don't have the right to look and do and pursue things that we want to. We have been purchased with a price. If you are truly a slave of God, a doulos of God, then we have to follow uh, the desires uh, and, and what is in the word of God, what is in the heart of God. We also belong to God and the words, uh, the scripture portions there that talks about how we belong to God that says you are Christ and Christ is God. None of us live to ourselves. We live, we live for the Lord. And then we are familiar with the portion that says we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are not our own. So glorify God with your bodies. So our mind, our soul, our spirit, our affections, our abilities, our talents, uh, our will, our emotion, everything that we are should belong to the Lord if we are truly saying that we are a Christian, that we are a duelos of the Lord. We are not the lords of our life, unlike what the culture around us says. Our ultimate allegiance and our loyalty is to the Lord and his word. Our true freedom will only come when we align with the will of God for our lives. So I think we've uh, talked about 1 verse 1, where we are slaves and why we are to do that. Let's go to 1 verse 8. 1 verse 8. Joe touched on 2 uh, through 8 quickly last time and talked mostly about the wisdom of God. Um, so I wanted to just take 1 verse 8 and uh, talk a, a, a few words in that particular verse, it says, such a person, a person without faith who is wavering, um, that doesn't have faith, uh, it says, such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in all that they do. If we are truly dwellers of the Lord, we need to have that one master, right? We need to have God uh, as our master, but many times the world and our own ego and many other things try to compete for our uh, mind, for our interests. That word double-mindedness, if you look into it, it says dipsychos, dipsychos. Di means two and psyche means mind, right? Mind. So we're almost double-minded or double-souled, it says. We're internally conflicted. Do we uh, live for the world or do we live for... For God, we are double-souled. If we have our legs in two boats, as long as they're going at the same speed, it's fine. But when one boat starts to take off, we'll fall flat on our face, right? We, need, we don't need half-hearted allegiance. Allegiance to God and, and also allegiance to ourself or to the world. As James 4.4 4 says, um, we should not be uh, in allegiance to the world. It says... Uh, loving the world is hating God in James 4, verse 4. We cannot be two-faced as Jesus taught us in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No, God, no man can serve, no slave can serve two masters, God and ma mammon, which shows money, right? The, the money and the system of this world. If we do, we will have a forked tongue, a tongue that does double talk, one thing uh, on one place, and then when we're in a different scene, we're talking something else, right? 
Our inconsistent actions will show where it's not the same or steady one day versus another. We're always like the sea that is tossed and turned, as we heard about, tossed and turned. So in 1 verse 8, we see a diagnosis there. It talks about someone who is double-minded. That's a disease, it says, double-minded. And what is a symptom? Unstable in all they do. So if we're being unstable in all the things that we do, we need to uh, wonder if that is because we are not giving our whole heart to the Lord. If we are half-hearted, if we're double-minded, double-souled, and we're being schizophrenic with our affection or, or, or uh, splitting our affection between those two things. Is our loyalty divided between God and the world, uh, or are we truly a doulos of the Lord? In that same uh, James chapter 4, verse 8, the prescription for that problem, uh, part of the prescription is there. It says, be single-minded to your groom, Jesus Christ. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So uh, the solution to being double-minded is to seek the face of God. Draw near to God, and God promises that he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, as we've been hearing over the last couple of weeks. Also, the prescription for this disease and symptom is in James 4, verse 4. James 4, verse 4. You adulterous people, it says, don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Friendship with the world is enmity with God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So it talks about this double-mindedness. There's always going to be the world and its system that will try to compete with our uh, love for the Lord. And they will always try to come in between, come in between and uh, take us away from the love of the Lord. So let me go back to the title and ask you the questions again. Is Jesus your savior only? Or is he your Lord and master? You know, uh, you can answer me and say it's impossible to be uh, just a savior. If you're just a savior, you're just a Christian in name only, that you've maybe prayed the prayer once and that you're not daily walking out your faith, that you're not uh, working out your salvation daily. And, and I would agree with you that uh, it's, not, it's one thing to say that I went to uh, a meeting and I confessed the Lord as my Savior, and then I'm going to go live any which way I want. But the Lord also said, yes, the gift of God is uh, free, and it is a grace of the Lord, and it is by faith that we take action and receive it. And it is also that daily we need to, to submit ourselves to be a doulos, a slave, to my curios and despotis, to my Lord, my Master, my sovereign Lord, my sovereign Lord. Um, I'd like to uh, end it with Colossians uh, 1, verse 21 to 23, as the time is only one minute remaining. Um, as the worship team's coming up, Colossians 1, verse 21 to 23. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death, to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. Jesus has already done his work. He has uh, done his job that he uh, has reconciled you uh, by his body, by shedding his body on the cross, and for everyone who believes in him and accepts him as Lord and Savior. Not just Savior, but Lord and Savior. And to, but that, that means, verse 23, if you continue in your faith, established and firm do not move from the hope held out in the gospel this is the gospel that you have heard and has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven that i paul have also become a servant or a slave so it is not a one-time experience to come to the lord but it is a continual walk by faith being firm established rooted and moving forward in our hope held out in the gospel and that is what the lord desires of us let us be doers of the word let us talk the talk and walk the walk uh, and not just talk the talk and not walk the walk um, and um, let us 
Uh, remember that the freest person in the world is one who is a slave to the Lord because he has redeemed us. He has called us friend. He has made us heirs and we have citizenship in heaven. Um, so if you truly think about that and how the Lord has called you and agree with Paul, Peter, John, Jake, uh, here Jacob, Jacob, or James, and you also uh, agree with Jude, all of the saints of God that were true disciples of Jesus said that, Lord, I am your servant, not your brother by blood, not, not any of those things, but I am your servant or your slave, and that is what we need to have and come to a realization of that. If that is truly our realization, then when we start to sing songs, we cannot sit still. From the bottom of our hearts, the worship will just come out. You know, you see what's going on, and people that have a true hunger, that have submitted themselves to the Lord, when they worship, there's a difference. And that is what we need to come to these days. I'm not blaming anybody, but let us uh, desire for that. Let us go forward uh, with that desire that we will be true slaves of the Lord. Let us be true duelos for our curios and for our despotis. May God bless you all with these words. Thank you, Jesus.